Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. We're gonna take a few minutes to allow people to join the session uh, and we'll wait for the numbers to stabilize before we start. Good, I think the numbers are starting to stabilize. Uh, panelist speakers, are you guys ready? Can I get a thumbs up? Good, thank you very much. Uh, so good morning and welcome everybody. Uh, thank, you, um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, today is the seventh uh, and final installation of the Developing Developers series of webinars that we launched uh, almost six months ago. Uh, and today we'll be focused on managing, operating, and maintaining renewable energy assets. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I am Nibeshan Gavinder, the COO at SAPIA, the Solar PV Industry Association. Uh, and thank you again to all of you who have been following the series since the start. And thank you to those who have joined today. Uh, you are indeed in for a treat. Uh, a big thank you to the sponsors, uh, Hamilton Renewable Energy for sponsoring today's uh, webinar. Uh, Mainstream Renewable Power and Juvie Renewable Energies for sponsoring this series of webinars and providing the opportunity for more participation in these important discussions. Um, so with 112 renewable energy projects built and 200 billion invested uh, and over 52,000 gigawatt hours of clean energy generated over the last 10 years, performance of renewable energy assets have become extremely important. Uh, while optimally operating and maintaining assets leads to better performance, ensuring the best outcomes for renewable energy projects actually begins at project development stage. And some may say this never ends. Uh, today we are going to be discussing with our esteemed panel of asset managers uh, the technical and operational challenges faced both by wind and solar PV assets. Uh, they will also be highlighting some of the solutions and learnings to better manage renewable energy assets. Uh, we will also touch very briefly on the opportunities within the area of operation and maintenance for more local participation. Uh, I think what's important to note today uh, is that we have changed the format of the session. Uh, if those of you have been following us for the series, today's uh, format is slightly different. Uh, we will be having one presentation uh, from Ms. Chanda Kumalo, who will be highlighting the asset management fundamental principles. Uh, and then we will move to a facilitated panel discussion, uh, which will be led by my co-host, Ms. Ntomi Fortin Tulia. Uh, please can I ask participants to post your questions in the Q&A session, or section, sorry. Uh, Lindo will be filtering through these questions uh, and he will select those questions that will be asked live. Uh, so what does this mean for you? We will activate your mic and you will be able to engage with the panelists directly and pose your question. Uh, the content prepared today by the speakers are planned to be useful and informative as usual. Um, I hope that you will enjoy the session. Uh, please can I ask you guys to stay even post the, the discussions as we will be announcing the new webinar series over the next six months. So without further ado, let me start by introducing our first speaker, uh, Ms. Chanda Kumalo, who is the Director of Hamilton Renewable Energy, uh, and she is the spokesperson and board member of SAPVIA. Her bio is available uh, it should have been displayed, but I see it's not, uh, but it was in the emails and we're happy to share it with you after the session. So I won't go into too much of detail. Um, so Chanda will be presenting on the fundamentals of managing renewable energy assets. Over to you, Chanda. Thanks, Nivesh. Um, and hello to everybody that's joined us. Um, I got a little bit carried away preparing for this. So I've got far too many slides and not enough time. <laughs> so I'm gonna whiz through them. Um, hopefully you uh, 
well, you'll get them afterwards so you can read some of the slides and if you have questions um, as we're going through then you can pose them during the panel discussion. Um, Kim, I won't go into too much detail about Harmattan, you'll have these slides where a technical consultancy um, that's uh, operating in the renewable energy space. You can keep going, Kim, it's fine. I don't think we need to dwell on this. Um, what I did want to want to start with is from uh, both a Sapvia and a Harmattan point of view, the uh, African best practice, African edition of the best practice guidelines for O&M for solar PV were launched last week. Um, so Sapvia and Harmattan have both contributed to redrafting these um, along with Solar Power Europe and a whole lot of other parties. So you can download them either on our website or the um, Solar Power Europe website, uh, but please do go take a look. It's really, it's an interesting read for those of you uh, getting into this um, space. Okay, Kim. Um, okay, so I've been asked to go through the fundamentals of O&M and managing assets um, across both wind and solar, which is a mammoth task. So um, what I've done is steal some bits from that, those best practice guidelines um, and just so that we can clarify what's normally meant by O&M because it's quite a wide topic. Um, so the understanding of it is it comprises asset management, which we'll go into detail about what falls under that, comprises operations of the project and also the maintenance of the project. Um, and I think all of these are, are separate um, topics and separate areas that people work in, but often get lumped into one um, and then things fall between the cracks about who's responsible for different areas of this. So it's very important to just be clear who is responsible for what. Next slide, please, Kim. Um, and why is O&M important? So we, we spend a lot of time and stress looking at developing projects and getting projects online. Um, but actually, the development and the construction phases are really the shortest phases in the life of a project. You're operating this plant for 20, hopefully as uh, lifetimes increase, up to 30 years. Um, and the contracts that we sign during the development um, phase and financial close have to cover this whole li um, life cycle. So it often gets neglected or pushed to the side because it's a, a different set of people and skill sets that are managing it, but really it is a very important part of the life cycle of the plant. Okay, Kim, next slide. Um, you can keep going. I'm going to um, just go into a little bit of an overview about the, con the O&M contract itself um, and what we're trying to do with a contract. And essentially that's to set out the obligations for the different parties very clearly from the beginning. So employer um, to pay the bills, contractors to provide the equipment. And sorry, some of these will jump between wind and solar. Apologies, I tried to make them technology agnostic, but clearly missed it here. So with the turbine supply agreement and then um, the services or the, or the O&M. And what is really the most important is it sets out the risk allocation um, between the parties. So if something happens or um, goes wrong, if things cost money, uh, more money than expected, who is responsible for payment and remedying of, um, of those issues? Okay, Kim. Um, and I've just set out here the different parties and the different types of agreements. So you can have an, a management agreement, then the, the O&M agreement specifically for the equipment. Um, and underneath that, you'll have the contractors, either third party or the um, original equipment manufacturer. Under the operations management agreement, you'll often have um, the, the operations manager who's responsible for balance of plant maintenance and also for the financial management, financial and commercial management of the plant. Okay, Kim. Um, in the operations and maintenance um, agreement, you need to, we well, basically say, again, we're saying setting out the duties of, of each party with regard to the maintenance period. And ideally, the contractor fixes anything that breaks immediately. Um, and if not, that they are liable for payment for any of the production lost on the plant. In reality, this is constrained by their availability of staff and spare parts. Um, so what you want to clarify, and I've just put some key points in here under the O&M agreement, and we'll go into a bit more detail of them later, is when does it start, um, which seems 
uh, seems obvious, but can actually be something that trips you up. Um, does it start when your first um, equipment goes online, so your first turbine? Does it start when your whole plant goes online? Who's responsible in between that period um, from the first to the last, if, if not? So being very clear about the start date is quite important and the costs of that. Your availability guarantee, which we'll go into a bit more detail um, later, transparency of maintenance and this is really important what you, you want to know what is happening on your plant and what is, what they the team are doing and that they're reporting to you on a regular basis of exactly what's going on um, key is the location of the service provider so I said up above that the contractor is uh, constrained by the availability of staff so if they are servicing more than one plant in the vicinity um, and are having to travel to you if they're not uh, based on site then you lose valuable time in them responding to uh, to issues on the site also the size of the team um, you know one person can only do so much so making sure that you've got an appropriately sized team for the size of your plant um, I've listed here what an all-inclusive agreement should include um, I'm not going to read through it now because we're going to go through some of this in a little bit more detail as we go um, we can go on to the next one Kim um, the term is also something that's um, important to discuss. I think the panel will look at this a bit later, but generally you're looking at five, 10, 12, 15 year contracts, um, particularly in the South African, African market um, because of risks that the lenders um, see and that they want, uh, they want longer term service providers or contracts on site. Um, ensure that you have break clauses in those contracts. So it's well and good signing up for 10 to 15 years, but you need to be able to change that service provider if needed. Um, always plan, hope for the best, plan for the worst is the, the best thing with contracts. Um, we've chatted about when is commencement. Um, and the risks with long-term contracts is that often that prices for um, things come down, particularly for O&M services, um, as a market matures and there's competition in that space. So you'll have signed up to something for 10 to 15 years um, and may well be able to procure that at a cheaper uh, rate in the life of the project. Um, so that's a, a key risk with the project. And then what aspects of the project have a shorter term than that initial five years, say, um, so your power curve warranty, your no noise warranties um, under the under a wind farm, and um, your performance ratio availability warranties for a solar farm, but we'll discuss those again a bit later. Okay, Kim, next one. Um, so yeah, we've I've put in here the warranties that are key that you define up front and have very clearly. So power curve, availability and noise under your, your wind and your performance ratio and availability and making sure that you have your liquidated damages negotiated. So there's a few hangovers from your initial supply agreement um, and really we'll talk again at, about end of warranty inspections, but your ability to claim on these warranties is much higher um, under your supply contract than it is under your O&M contract. Your O&M contract is generally, the liabilities are capped at 100% of the annual fee, which obviously is much less than what you paid to buy the equipment. So you need to make sure that um, you spot anything that's wrong or needs to be remedied before your uh, supply warranties run out. Um, I, in, in terms of, um, actually, no, I'm not gonna go into detail on each of them. You can go, Kim, I think it's easier for people to read them. Um, go to the next one. Um, so we discussed availability and again, because I have so many slides, um, please feel free to read, but essentially what to look at when you're looking at availability warranty is it's not versus the total amount of time that your plant is running. There's a lot of exclusions that are uh, built into an uh, availability warranty. So you need to be very clear about what the definition is. So it's that your total time minus excluded times, generally times for scheduled maintenance. Um, generally, there's a ramp up period at the front, uh, at the beginning of the, um, the project lifetime. Um, and other, I think if you go to the next one, Kim, um, other exclusions that are um, put in place, I'm gonna do the key ones for, the key list here is for um, solar plants, but applies in the majority of it applies to wind. So looking at force majeure, damage that's caused by a third party. So being very careful about who operates and maintains the equipment that's not the OEM. Um, grid disruption, so managing that as well. Um, and all of these can't be allocated to your O&M contractor. Um, 
it's important then that you track what is and isn't available so that you can claim. There's two different types of availability as well. There's a time-based one, which we just discussed, and then an energy-based, which a lot of projects are moving towards now. Um, and that takes into consideration that um, if there is a higher wind period or a period of higher irradiance, that it's more valuable to you as the owner um, than ones with slightly lower um, wind or irradiance. And therefore, the calculation takes not just not time, but energy lost into consideration, um, which incentivizes the O&M contractor to do their maintenance at low resource times rather than just um, when they want to. Okay, I can keep going, can you? Um, payment mechanisms, um, basically base price and then escalation. There's often availability um, bonuses uh, for meeting, uh, for exceeding the guarantee. Um, I again, yeah, let's let's just skip through this one because I think people can can read this, but it's important to understand what you're paying for and how and when you'll be available or you'll be liable for those um, those bonuses. These are some of the risks I mentioned before that follow through from the initial supply agreement um, and that you want to kind of keep an eye on over the first uh, couple of years. So your design and, and defects are a particular one. You'll have a defects notification period for the first two years um, where you can claim um, any issues that, uh, that occur on the equipment um, from the manufacturer. There's the general warranties that are done at the bottom related to that, um, including workmanship and qual quality of material. And then a key one is also serial defects. So if there are a significant number of parts um, or um, parts of the equipment that fail and they need there's very specific definitions for this so it needs to be manufactured um, in the same in the same factory it needs to be over a certain percent in exactly the same turbines globally but it's something that's what that is really worth negotiating and having in the contract okay next Kim um, reporting um, so you can jump through to this what I've given you in these slides and again, not to um, dwell on it, is a list of the key performance indicators that you ought to be tracking as a manager or an operator of a site. And um, the first um, two slides, and uh, yeah, Kim, if you, you, I think, skip through um, one, two, uh, go to the fourth one where there's a table. That's a bit easier um, and gives a, yeah here so um this basically splits it into different areas but essentially um you are looking to report to either you are tracking them as the asset manager or your o m provider is providing information on all of these kpis so that you can understand how they're performing versus um their contractual obligations so raw data measurements and these ones are solar but irradiation or um wind resource and then your energy produced and consumed. Um, consumed is a bit of a best practice, but the other two are a minimum requirement for what you're looking for on um, under your KPIs. And then for the plant itself, what is the yield um, that you had forecast versus what is the yield that's actually uh, you're getting on the site, um, both for solar and for wind. Here is performance ratio, but for wind you'd be looking at at the availability um, as well. And then also tracking what your O&M contractor is doing, um, which is something that is, is often forgotten. So how long is it taking them to respond to things? What is the downtime um, on your equipment? Um, what, how are they managing your spare parts? So how long is it taking them to then repair um, equi uh, equipment? Um, so these are covered under these KPIs and then um, your environmental KPIs as well. So tracking what is happening, both environmental and health and safety is, um, are key KPIs for you to be tracking. Okay, next one, Kim. Um, maintenance strategies, again, just in the interests of um, time, I won't go through through each of these slides, but basically when there are a few different strategies that you can take to managing a project. Um, so this, um, the chart at the top, your choices are preventive, there's preventive maintenance and corrective maintenance. So preventive maintenance means you are um, preempting works that need to happen on the project um, and therefore minimizing the downtime associated with any uh, breakages. Corrective means let it fail um, and basically fix it once it's broken. Um, there are issues associated with that in terms of um, the 
downtime that you will um, suffer as a result of it, um, and also the um, the issues linked to it. So if you let, for example, on a wind turbine, a gearbox um, go until it fails, there's um, subsequent uh, failures and impacts on the rest of the turbine and um, that you then have to repair as well. So preventive maintenance really is, um, is important for the site uh, to maximize the production of, of the equipment. Um, and you can do this in a couple of ways. So see here, condition-based ma maintenance and predetermined maintenance. Um, condition-based maintenance requires you to have quite a lot of uh, finger on the pulse of the data and the activities that are happening on your site. So tracking all of that um, and analysis of how equipment is operating, um, but worth putting in place from the beginning of your site operating so that you're then building up a database of failures and failure rates um, and how your equipment behaves. Um, Kim, I think then you're, what you'll see is a bit more detail on all of this as we go through. So go, if you go uh, two slides forward, um, I mentioned that um, looking at preventative maintenance, you need to understand what's happening with your equipment. What I've given you in, in these slides is a distribution of the downtime. So this is for um, for a wind turbine where the majority of the breakdowns occur um, and you'll see ge uh, gears and um, generators forming the, the sorry, gen gears, control system generators forming the top three. Um, and it, But it's important also to understand not just the percentage of equipment that breaks down, but the uh, the related loss in energy that it causes so that you can allocate resource appropriately. Um, so I've given you this for the um, for the wind turbines. And then Kim, if you can scroll through, there's the there's some um, data on downtimes per failure in terms of hours. And then if you go to the next one, I've done the same thing um, from some research reports, and this is based on solar projects. Um, so again, you'll see here on the right hand side is the, the total failures um, and the left hand side is, is the energy loss. So the majority of um, failures are actually related to the monitoring system, but those don't give you a huge amount of energy lost um, across the solar project. Um, then if you look uh, on the slide at the bottom, it's gone into a bit more detail of the um, the um, equipment in the modules. So the modules um, fail, have the highest failure rate, um, but second in terms of the energy loss, that the highest energy loss is due to failures in the junction box. So these are things that you need to be managing and monitoring over the life of the project and trying to prevent, um, prevent failures occurring when you are trying to generate energy. Okay, um, next one, Kim. Thanks. Okay, then we're just going to go briefly into spare parts management. I think one of the key things that um, operators um, leave to the O&M is um, management of the spare parts. Um, and so just a, a kind of a brief thing about why it matters and this links to what we were just discussing about downtime. Um, as often the question is, well, if your parts aren't available, isn't that covered under your availability warranty and would you be able to cl uh, claim under the, uh, the O&M contract? The question then is what you lose versus what you're reimbursed. Um, and so in the next slide, if you can just go through to that, Kim, I've just given you an uh, example on a wind um, farm of a blade failure. So it often costs much more in, lo uh, in lost revenue. If the blade isn't in stock, you're gonna have lead time for manufacturing, say a hundred days, transportation time, assuming that you don't need to get permits and go through customs and things like that, 20 days installation another three again assuming you can get a crane on site then you add your labor your crane um, higher costs and um, so it becomes a significant uh, cost to you as the project and depending on the size of the project it may or may not affect your availability warranty right if you've got hundreds of turbines and only one is down um, it may not have a big dent on that percentage availability but it will have a big cost to you as um, as the project um, of Ooh, just I was, sorry, it's not finished on this one. Um, and then you'll see in the the uh, point down below, just looking at an example of a bearing problem, say a thousand dollars to repair a, a bearing, which can lead to a hundred thousand dollar gearbox replacement. Um, then you need to uh, to rewind the generator and the associated crane hire. So one post warranty gearbox failure can cost about ten to fifteen percent of the uh, of the turbine cost. Um, 
So it's worth managing and tracking not only your uh, the down the downtime, but also that you have spare parts available and that you're um, able to respond to any failures as rapidly as possible. Um, okay, okay, here we go. Um, I've tried to then in this, and um, this is just alternatives to O and M. And you know, right now in the market, there's not a huge number of companies that are providing third party uh, O&M services, but it is something that happens globally. Um, so you're, as an owner, you can choose a strategy um, depending on what your risk uh, appetite is. So either going with the original equipment manufacturer, going with a third party or self-performing and a lot of larger utilities and um, IPPs do this. Um, and then I think Kim, you can just skip uh, next on, I've given you just some of the types of warranties that you can get with those options. Um, we had then chatted earlier, you can go to the next one, Kim, thank you. Uh, then, then chatted earlier, I said about, I was going to go through end of warranty inspections. Um, so if your initial warranty from the supply agreement ends at two years, um, the question then is why would you have an end of warranty inspection because the O&M contractor is going to be on site for five years and do you really care because you can still claim. As I said, the, the thing is that you have uh, access to a lot much greater liability uh, under the supply agreement than you do under the O&M agreement. Um, the other thing to, um, to bear in mind is that you, know, you want to understand what is likely to re reduce performance of your plant over the, the rest of the lifetime of the plant and not just take the OEM's word for that in the first two years. Um, so it's very important that you do this as important as doing the inspection post commissioning of a plant, um, which we always do and don't question, whereas an end of warranty inspection often um, is something that it's difficult to persuade companies to agree to or find um, costs for. Um, the, you can go to the next slide, Kim. I've just put in here kind of the recommended process. Again, but just because it's uh, something that's difficult to get companies to agree to, it often gets left till the last minute. And the thing is you want to be able to claim. So you need to do it at least three months prior to the end of the warranty period. So you have the inspections completed, the reports completed, and then submitted to your OEM if there's any issues that they need to remedy before they disappear off site. Um, and, and in terms of the, the recommended process I've put on here, it's really, it's a, it's a discussion that you need to have. So don't approach it as a, an argument. I think that makes things um, difficult to remedy then, um, but presenting them with uh, any anything that you found on site that is their responsibility to, to remedy uh, prior to the end of the warranty. Um, Kim, sorry, I think there's a duplication with these next three slides, so you can skip then to the asset management one, and then I'm done. Um, next one. So asset management. So I said at the beginning, there's you know, different areas under the O&M that you need to look at. And um, so I've given you some of the tasks that fall under the operations and maintenance and some of the tasks that fall um, under the asset management. And the asset management really is primarily making sure that everything on site um, happens. And yeah, sorry, Kim, you can go to the next one. Because it's a, um, so I've given you here again, a, de a definition of what's an asset, but really it's Asset management is coordinating all of the activities and practices which an organization optimally and uh, sustainably manages as assets and systems. So you're basically trying to maximize performance, minimize risks and expenditures over the life of, of your project. So it's quite a complicated role, involves a lot of different parties and, and stakeholders. Um, and it's something that is often, I think, taken for granted, the value that it, it adds to a project. Um, uh, in the next slide, you can go, Kim. Um, first rule, and again, sorry, this applies to wind farms for the sun, but first rule of uh, operating wind farms is keep them spinning. Um, so really, you want your plant to be uh, available and operating um, for as much time as it possibly can, because that's generating you revenues. And as an asset manager, it's your job to ensure that. Um, from the point of view I've put um, just down here, some of the 
goals as a as an asset manager is you want high availability you want to reduce the cost for service and repair and you want to ensure a long lifetime for your equipment you don't want to have to um to keep on replacing equipment over your 20-year life and then from the point of view of your, you as an asset manager slash operator is you're um, trying to ensure that there's a short reaction time in, in case of failures. So as we chatted about the downtime, you're trying to minimize that. Um, you can then be responsible for detecting problems on your own and then managing the O&M contractor to ensure they respond appropriately um, and doing this by scheduling inspections and preventative maintenance when, when appropriate. You know, often you'll get a facility operating plan from the O&M contractor and that doesn't necessarily reflect the weather on site, if there's high radiation, if there's high wind, so managing all of those movements um, on site. And then finally, um, data, 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 data. Um, you have access to your monthly reports and your SCADA system from your OEM, but often um, we don't delve into the detail of what is what we actually have available and really that statistical analysis of all the available data is very important as an asset manager to help you guide your decision making process. Okay, whistle stop tour through O&M. Um, so hopefully it wasn't too fast, um, but please feel free to ask me any questions or um, ask to the panel who also will, I think will cover some of the topics. Good. Thank you very much for that, Chan. A very informative uh, presentation and well done on keeping to your time. Uh, a lot of information in that short amount of time. Uh, and I think it's all required information for us to better understand uh, asset management, uh, operation, and maintenance, uh, which is quite complicated and extensive. Uh, once again, uh, just to the participants, please keep your questions going. Thank you for those of you who have already posed the questions. Maybe just to note that Chanda will join the panel after the panel discussion for the Q&A session as well. So some of the questions will be posed to her at that point. Um, yeah, and good, let's move on. So you see our esteemed panel of speakers up on your screen. I'm going to ask for each of them to please switch on their cameras. Uh, Kim, can I ask us to take down the slide presentation so we can see the speakers? I think um, the facilitator of this session is my, my friend and co-host, Ms. Ntobi Fujin Tuli, uh, the CEO of Sovia. I don't think she needs much more of an introduction. So I will hand over to her to, to introduce the rest of her panel. Uh, and they will together be uh, discussing how to successfully operate and maintain renewable energy assets. They will be looking at the challenges and opportunities within the space. Uh, and they'll also be talking to the lessons learned to optimize renewable energy plant longevity. Over to you, Antonio. Uh, thanks so much, Niveshan. And uh, thanks, Chanda, for a very uh, educational um, presentation. Uh, we're certainly learning a lot uh, from the sessions, and I'm sure our audience would echo to that. Uh, so, like Nivashan has already said, and today, because it's our last session, we decided to take a slightly different approach in, in the way we present. And um, I'll, I'll be joined by a panel of uh, very esteemed um, speakers who are going to take us through and share their experiences in the operation and maintenance of either solar PV or wind uh, projects. So first we have Lindan Butelezi. Um, who is a technical manager at Dopa Wind Farm. Um, he joined Dopa in 2019, and his experience in renewable energy industry is specifically in technical operations management of wind farms. It actually spans over five years, and uh, he's got a very strong passion for data-driven operations and improved asset optimization and performance. Um, and then next we have uh, Tom Goss, uh, Tom is a team leader for planning at Vesta South, Southern Africa. He's been with Vestas for six years and, um, and he covers areas such as um, adhering to all contract obligations related to OMM, as well as business uh, process improvements. He has successfully done commissioning uh, planning for six of uh, Vestas operational assets. Uh, we are also joined in the panel by Ramona Mohanlal, 
who's the head of operations and HR at Rustmore Solar Farm. Uh, Ramona is an operations expert. She, she has worked in many industries, including energy, entertainment, gaming, NPOs. And um, she, she also has an experienced uh, project manager. Uh, she has several projects across uh, the industries that she has worked in. Uh, she has a very well-rounded HR knowledge and economic development experience, and she's currently pursuing her MBA. Uh, last but not least, we are also joined by uh, Crompton Saunders, who is an asset director at Mobilec. Uh, Crompton has, is a registered professional engineer with a master's in engineering management. He has been working in the engineering field since 2008 and uh, joined Globalec in 2014 and has occupied different positions in operation and maintenance up until now when he is now an asset director for AR Solar and Drogfontein Solar, where he is responsible for key o and and asset management services. So that's my panel for today. Uh, and I'm sure most of the questions that uh, the, the audience might have uh, related to uh, Chanda's presentation might actually be um, answered in this discussion that we're going to have. So I'd like to kick off with a question to Lindani. Um, so as a plant is handed to you after construction, uh, Lindani, what are the main lessons that you can share regarding the transitioning from construction to full operations? And how would you advise someone to better manage this process? Um, good afternoon, Dombi, and, uh, and your co-host, um, Kim. Um, and thanks for the question. And uh, I do appreciate having been invited and, and uh, just to share my experience on, on wind energy. I just want to add that Shanda has done a very good job. It's fantastic. Could have, have been better. Um, she's covered everything really, really well. And um, uh, yeah, I'll just try and answer the question. And I've seen some of the questions come through on the Q&A. Uh, I, I might answer one or two of them from my response already. Um, but generally what you want to achieve when you transition a project from, from a construction phase to an operation, I would say, I think as an asset owner, what you really want to do is when you approach operations, you need to have sort of a life cycle approach to operations and um, not view it as we have a five-year agreement with the service provider. So when you as an owner yourself have that sort of idea in your mind, it actually makes things a little bit easier that you actually think quite far ahead. So um, because the, the transition from operation generally is um, um, full of things which are legacy issues from construction, so what you really want to do is you want to make sure that all those issues which relate to end of warranty, as how Shanda has explained, are fully closed off. So in doing that, you need to first understand your contracts. So you need to understand um, the EPC contract. Normally, is the EPC contract. You need to understand your operations contract, which is your O&M agreement. Um, because generally on your EPC contract, you would have a lot of um, liability which can be covered under that contract. So once you understand that, then you know exactly which are the things you would want to drive through the transition into the operations contract. And um, in my experience, I have found that um, a lot of the times the OMs and excuse anyone who is an OM here, but a lot of the times the OMs like to sort of downplay a lot of the issues that are in the EPC agreement, and they want to almost make you believe that it can be taken care of under the operation and maintenance screen, which is fair enough. I think it is fair enough. However, if you fail to properly record the data and ensure that the, the items are notified in line with the contractual requirements, there's very little you can do when the project is ongoing to force the contractor or the O&M uh, provider to actually do that work for you. So I think it's important to really check your contract and ensure that everything is covered. Um, and with that, um, it may be worthwhile to also request your O&M provider to even go as far as providing a bond to ensure that if, if they do not do the work, you can go out in the market and get someone with similar expertise do the work for you. 
I don't think anyone has reached that extent in the industry as yet. I think the OEMs that we have in South Africa have been quite open-minded and have really done a, a good job, generally speaking. Um, but I think it's a good thing from a contractual point of view because you have also your, your shareholders, you have your lenders, which you also need to appease and you need to make them happy. So that is one of the important things to ensure in the transition phase. Um, the other thing is just to check who is responsible for what. Um, generally, during construction phase, you would find that the contractor is responsible for about everything, you know, your health and safety, your environmental aspects, um, lies on with all the other stakeholders, including ESCOM, so things like grid code compliance, et cetera, et cetera. They would all be fully responsible and liable. When you have that transition, um, it's important that you really check the contract and check especially the ONM agreement to see that um, all the things that are not covered under that agreement, you have put contingency measures in place to ensure that these things are taken care of. Um, and um, mm -hmm. typically, just to answer one of the questions on the Q&A, the end of warranty or defect liability period. Okay, let's wait a bit with the Q&A questions. <laughs> Uh, can we wait a bit with the Q&A questions? Okay. We're going to oh. come back to that. No problem. All right. Uh, because you, you spoke about the relationship between the asset manager and the OEM providing the, the, the O&M service, uh, I would like to bring in Tom as he represents an OEM into the, into the conversation. Maybe he does agree with you on those things. But specifically, Tom, if you can just explain to us um, it, as, as you are responsible for operations and maintenance, what is a typical day uh, for an O&M team look like? And what exactly is involved in the O&M of a wind farm? And also, how do you ensure that the annual maintenance schedule is performed within agreed timeframes? Yeah. Uh, good day all, I am Tomu Thank you for the opportunity. And also thank you for Shanda for a great presentation that she's covered. I think she's covered most of the things. Uh, if I may respond to uh, Nelani, I think a daily, uh, a, a normal day in uh, operation, first of all, we, we need to ensure that we adhere to all the safety protocols that has been set in place. Uh, when, we, when we look at uh, the operational side of the turbine, we need to ensure that we provide the necessary skills and training to our technicians to ensure that we 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 assign the, the correct people to uh, for the task. Then, secondly, with regards to the, the the maintenance, what we normally do is we we have local warehousing in place to ensure that materials are being delivered on site in time. And working that back, we normally request for materials to come to site earlier than than nine months before maintenance com uh, commence. So we also have uh, various systems that we use, especially when it comes to the improvement of the turbines, which I believe that what we do is we look at failure rates of uh, previous turbines. We have dedicated teams assigned uh, to these protocols. And if we do not have a dedicated person locally, we do have custom engineers, uh, customer support engineers that will technically support our guys with the functions, but I think the, the most important it, uh, is to give our commitment to the client. So give our commitment to the asset and as Shanda mentioned that we uh, lower uh, breakdowns, so uh, troubleshooting turnaround times at a high efficiency rate. And the most important part is training our personnel. So we do train our guys uh, each year, we do, have awareness training for them to uplift the skill. And what we normally do is we give the client events report on what has been done on site. So that is the basically a day in the life of, 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 of operations. I do know there are some things that cannot be uh, resolved within a day, but we do strive to give the best we can. Uh, Lenan, oh. um, I hope I answered you. Yeah, definitely. And um, I mean, that's interesting, but I, I suppose the audience also wants to know a, a, a day in the life of an O&M expert in a solar farm. So I'll bring in Crompton into the conversation. 
uh, just to take us through uh, some of the um, what what is involved in operation and maintenance in the solar solar PV uh, assets. Thanks, uh, Dombi. Um, so yeah, thanks and thanks everybody. Um, great to be here. Uh, first of all, I see there's quite a lot of colleagues, fellow board members, uh, consultants, uh, service providers on the call. So I have to be careful about what I say. <laughs> I say. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I will be measured in, in my responses. Um, but yeah, I think, um, first of all, what's interesting about these assets um, and for, for us who are in, in the industry, automatically you know get to experience that for, but I think for for people who are not um, you know these assets are quite fascinating you know it's it's not just o and m and, and asset management it's you know a mesh of commercial technical financial um, you know processes and systems that work together on an ongoing basis to 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 um, you know make these assets deliver the, the value that the shareholders are expecting um, yeah, on the operations front, um, on a solar plant, I think maybe an interesting uh, perspective um, on OEM would be to just, I think, maybe draw it back to the, uh, you know, sort of development cycle. Um, because I think a lot of decision making in development has an impact on, on what happens in, in operations. Um, and again, my, my, my approach to, to, to my job in, in general is a very systems approach. So I will always take a bit of a broader perspective on things. And I think what's really important in, in most businesses is, um, and specifically in, in our industry is, um, you know, there's always competing priorities between teams that design these plants, build these plants, and then have to operate them afterwards. Um, you know, there's, there's different incentives um, for, for each of those teams. Um, and, you know, depending on how well these businesses are integrated, um, you know, could dictate how, how well those interactions between those various um, teams work um, and ultimately, um, you know, result in a, in a better product that can be run uh, more effectively during, during operations. And some of the stuff you typically, you know, have to think about um, during the design phase um, to support operations. Um, again, uh, you know, there's no one size fits all for, for each business. If you have multiple assets, one of the things that you could be looking at is if I have a fleet of assets that will be, you know, relatively close or in the same region, um, you know, looking at standardized equipment, um, because that can help make, uh, you know, doing maintenance much easier. Uh, you can use the same teams over a broad um, geographical area. Uh, you can share spare parts, um, makes commercial relationships with uh, um, suppliers um, much easier, etc. Um, it's also important to consider sort of you know where a plant could be in terms of um, designing for maintainability. Um, you know, going with um, one uh, main grid transformer instead of two um, low loss um, versus um, normal loss transformers. Um, you know understanding the impact of those different design choices because um, you know if you've got um, one main transformer if you lose the transformer the plants out for an extended period of time um, if you go with um, you know a large number of transformers you've got more equipment to maintain um, but you lose smaller areas of the plant when you do have failures um, so in in the design phase it's important to go and consider those different design options um, you know, take some time to do the relevant modeling, understand what the, the CAPEX, OPEX, um, and operational implications of, of, of those things are to make, um, you know, to make the best decision going forward. Okay, maybe following on to that question, there's also a question of the industry is maturing and uh, what sort of standards or best practice guidelines are available to help improve operational maturity? Because I suppose o &M when the plant is new and when the plant is uh, in this uh, next decade of operation is not the same. Do you have any comments around that? Um, yeah, so I think, um, you know, the solar industry is, is yeah, mature, maturing is maybe a strong word. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely um, growing in maturity um, in the sense that, you know, 
the solar industry is really only at this stage about six or seven years old from a utility scale perspective. Um, and you know, a lot of a lot of the experience we've we've gained in South Africa, um, I think, has been very valuable in um, I think maturing the you know the general skills that's available in the industry around technical management, but also you know I think just general management um, of these assets. Um, from a a, a more um, uh, formal perspective, um, I think Chanda mentioned um, you know the Solar Europe. Um, o and best practices that's been developed. Um, so that process has been ongoing for, I think, at least three or four years already. Um, so there's a set of best practices developed by the Solar Europe, which is like, um, you know, Sevilla or, or, or Sawaya for, for the European, European market. Um, so they've developed a set of uh, standards called, which they call so, um, Solar o and best practice. They've got the asset management best practice. Um, you know, they've done work on developing EPC best practices. Um, and as Chanda has mentioned, they you know have sort of modified some of that specifically for the African the African market. Um, and then there's some of the, the other usual suspects um, in the states like NREL, who's also developed um, you know suite of of best practices. Um, and then I think just from personal experience, um, um, very early on globally. Um, specifically use the ISO 55000 asset management standard, which again is a, a broader standard that covers asset management and O&M. But as I said, these things are very integrated. It's very difficult to split them. Um, so taking the standard, um, you know, applying, uh, looking at best practices in other markets like mining that's been around for some time, using local um, and international renewable experience to um, to develop a framework that's focused on renewables and then continuing the process of sort of assessing um, again standard and best practices and maturing your own internal um, organizational um, functions um, where it's relevant for you in terms of um, the renewable sector. Um, so there are definitely a few things out there that's um, for people to, to help them navigate um, and improve maturity. Oh, thanks, thanks, thanks for that, uh, Quentin. Uh, I want to shift the conversation from uh, technical to other elements of uh, asset management in the renewable energy space. Um, Ramona, maybe to bring you into the conversation, obviously managing a solar farm is not only about technical operations, but it also involves uh, managing community relations. Uh, does your business find challenges in communities uh, which in, in the communities in which you operate and how do they impact on your operations and especially on your bottom line as a business? Good afternoon. Thank you, Ntombi, and uh, good afternoon to everyone listening in and uh, thank you to my fellow panelists. Uh, so I have the very, very great privilege of being part of one of the older uh, solar farms in the industry. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Rasmo was actually the first PV plant to connect to the grid. Um, and we actually are, have entered year eight for our operations. Um, and I think that's important in that that means we've maintained a relationship within the community that we operate in for that amount of time. And I'm happy to say that we've managed to maintain a relationship that is mutually beneficial, um, simply because community members that were involved in the actual construction of RASMO, some of them still work in our plant today in different roles. Um, we also have engaged the community in terms of making sure that our community development elements look out after the communities around us. Um, we're based in, in Marikana, which we also know has challenges with the communities. Um, and I think the, the two important things that I would say that have helped Rasmo is that there's always open communication. So whatever Rasmo might be doing, whether it's additional construction, changes in the way we do things, or just letting the communities around us know of anything that's going to happen that might impact them, the communication lines are always open. Uh, second to that, uh, we always making sure that all of our other stakeholders, be it our lenders, be it our shareholders, are always involved in some fashion in anything that we do do in the community. Um, and I think that it's of the utmost importance that we have the communities around our plants involved. Um, 
they create a community around your plant in terms of safety. Uh, you, I'll give you a perfect example. During uh, the start of the hard lockdown for COVID-19, Rasmo shut itself down in terms of isolating staff on the plant. And it was a first for us, a first for everyone all over the country, all over the world. And our plant was safe. And I think that's because of the relationship that we have with the community and the fact that they are engaged and they feel that Rasmo is part of them. No, thanks, thanks so much for that. It's always nice to see uh, projects working very well with communities because, I mean, if you're planning to be with this community for 20 years, uh, obviously you need to build a mutually beneficial relationship. Uh, maybe just to move on to just discuss uh, slightly a relationship between management and o &M contractors. Uh, are there any challenges that uh, the plants uh, face uh, currently uh, with regards to that management uh, between the asset owner and the, the, the o &M contractors, Ramona? So I, I think uh, once again, I'll say here that um, it's all about communication and keeping those lines of communication open. Um, mm -hmm. Our o &M contractor is um, also the, they were the same company that was the EPC. So the relationship uh, moved from the construction to the operations and maintenance of the plant uh, pretty smoothly. I wasn't there at the time, but from what I've understood, the relationship has always been a good positive one. Um, and I think from Rasmo's point of view, once again, there's always an open line of communication between all of the stakeholders involved. So anything that is happening in, in the plant, um, there's never a, a feeling that someone can't call you up after off hours on a Friday with whatever issue there might be. Uh, the challenges I would say could possibly come in if there's too many people involved. Um, and the way Rasmo has managed to make sure that all of that is streamlined is that we have our specific people within Rasmo and our O&M contractors that deal with specific things. Um, so there are certain people within Rasmo that give instructions at certain levels, the same with the O&M contractor. And I think that has helped us to streamline the, the, the efficiency of the relationship. Mm. Thank you. Oh, great. Um, and then maybe sticking with the, with the challenges, I'd also like to know uh, from you, Lindani, what are the main technical challenges that one can expect to experience in operational wind farm from your experience and what have been the causes um, and most importantly, how do you resolve those? Okay, um, <clears throat> thanks Tommy for the question. Um, yeah, wind farms are very beautiful machines. I think um, they are capable of really operating really smoothly if um, they are well taken care of. Um, by both the OEM and the asset owner has got a, a vested interest. But maybe to answer your question, the main challenges that we have, um, or rather that I, I know of within the industry, and that is thing that we have also experienced in other OEMs that I know, um, they relate mainly to the major components, which are the blades, the gearboxes, the main bearings, um, not so much foundations and tower, but it's really, around the drive drivetrain components and the and the blades. And on the blades, it's purely in, in generally from what I've seen, purely related to lightning strikes. Um, we have seen some sites get really bad strikes. In fact, our site is one of those sites that um, is quite severely affected by this. Um, so um, but from the from the other components perspective, it is um, main bearings, gearboxes, um, sometimes main, main, main converters, which are basically the grid integration uh, equipment. Um, and um, you also do find other challenges, just minor challenges due to day-to-day -day issues like the pitch system um, or the main issue with the hydraulic system, etc. And what we have found is that the main causes on just generally mechanical and electrical system could, could either be due to a manufacturing defect or due to a maintenance issue. So the maintenance was not conducted adequately, or it could be due to um, the, uh, 
the, 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 the way that the machine has been operated in the conditions. So those are the three main drivers, if I may say. Um, but I think the other thing which is generally for me that I've found that is quite a key driver to especially availability, which is influenced by how well your machines are being run is the people factor. You know, if you have the right people in your site, both from the OM and the asset owner point of view, um, and from the asset owner purely to provide the oversight, you know, and do the inspections and check that the work is being done on time and um, ensure that the owner's interests are, are, um, are kept at site level. It's, it's very important and I think it's quite fundamental. You know, if you have the right people, you are almost assured that the asset will perform well. But um, yeah, those are really, in, in, in summary, the main technical challenges. It's major, major component related and also um, on the minor things, day-to-day -day things where it's generally related to people. I don't know if I've answered the question. All right. No, thanks. Um, I was actually going to ask a follow-up, but I'm just going to direct it to Tom. Okay. Uh, as an, an OEM, <laughs> do, do you experience any challenges with main component replacement? As uh, Lindani has highlighted that as one of the key challenges, especially in terms of availability and uh, of critical spare parts at the time that you need them. Tom? Thank you for that, Tom Fiti. Yes. Uh... Yes, I can agree with him on some of the, the concerns raised. I think for us, it's basically with regards to the, the skills when it comes to uh, a third party service provider, which uh, needs to replace the, the main component for us. Uh, as I mentioned for us, the challenge was before when we didn't have all of the skills transfer, but like I said, we've managed to train our guys. So it's basically when you have ad hoc and you have uh, expertise type of jobs as plates, you know, you cannot just replace a plate. So there's, there should be certain repairs done. And as a incoming market in South Africa, we have tried now to, to train most of our guys in order to do this uh, blade repairs, to do the main component replacement, I think, Mostly for us, the challenge comes into when you have to use somebody that, uh, that can operate a crane because those are external companies which we do not provide that service for. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I think uh, we have managed that well now because what we are now currently doing, as I mentioned, we're working with our technical support team to having the guys up to the preferred knowledge in order to fast track and also lower the downtime. Uh, but as I mentioned, that it will always be there since we, we do not have the services yet of, of owning our own uh, brain. And which also, when you look at local content, and this is where we render the services out because we also need to, to, to give some development back to, to most of the subcontracts. That is all for me. Tell me, do asset managers... Uh... Um, able to recover, are they able to recover from the financial loss uh, experience as a result of a uh, downtime? Uh, I'm talking about unplanned maintenance. Uh, can you just repeat it? I didn't get it. Um, I'm, I'm asking if asset managers, and maybe not for you, maybe for asset managers, if they're able to make up or recover from the financial loss that is experienced as a result of downtime. Uh, maybe there they is um, an unplanned maintenance that needs to be done. It's, to me, it's quite, it's quite tough at times to, to cover. Um, I think in wind specifically, um, you know, I think most wind farms, specifically in South Africa, have struggled to eat E50, um, you know, consistently. So I think that's the first issue is that, you know, you, you're always on the back foot. Um, the second thing, you know, once a failure occurs, um, there's very little else you can shift around to either, you know, re reduce maintenance that you're planning later the year, because, you know, that could also have a negative effect. Um, so, you know, the ideal is never to, to push out maintenance or, or, you know, but sometimes there's an opportunity to push out larger CapEx projects. Um, you know, so maybe you had, um, you know, ESCOM, one, you needed to install a filter for grid code and you 
you know, get some mechanism of just pushing it out into the next financial year, um, you know, and uh, not spend that money in, in, in that specific year. So it will always, you know, more be a different financial mechanism that you use um, opposed to trying to generate more revenue um, because that's quite difficult um, in, in our industry. It's not like a gas plant where um, it's much easier to Mm. Okay, no, thanks for that, Compton. And maybe you can uh, tell us a bit more because we've uh, up to so far I've spoken about challenges uh, with the wind farms, but in the solar plants, do you experience different kinds of challenges in the oil and waste? Mm. Yeah, and I think interestingly, there'll obviously be very similar, there's a lot of similarities between wind and solar. Um, and I think just again, I, I think it's I often laugh and or giggle to myself when people say technical challenges because it's normally technical, commercial, you know, starts off technical but very quickly becomes a commercial, commercial issue, specifically in the first few, few years of, of, of the plant life. Um, but yeah, I think obsolescence is quite a challenge. Um, uh, you know, as Ramona said, we also have one of, you know, a couple of the, the, the very early round one plants um, sort of, you know, operating very early from 2014, um, already experiencing key issues with obsolescence. Um, and, you know, part of the challenge is obviously there's been a lot of movement in the solar market with players um, leaving the market, um, you know, selling their businesses. Um, so obsolescence has become uh, quite an issue um, because, you know, some of these designs, early designs were very really custom, it's not off the shelf. Um, you know, it, it really, uh, you know, adds to the complexity um, when you have key uh, components like... Uh, pop, That's a know, big concern. That's a big concern because parts it's, availability when companies go... It's, it's, it's huge and not just, not just parts, but also the, um, you know, the, the skill, the know-how about the technology. Um, you know, mm. so, you know, if you... If you have a small, if you were, you know, bought from smaller players at the time and, and they've, they've disappeared or were integrated into other businesses, it's difficult to find those people that can support. Um, we can spend the whole discussion just on obsolescence, but I think some of the other key challenges, um, I think terminations has been um, quite an interesting one, you know, whether it's terminations on the substation, um, switch gear, whether it's, you know, in the field, on the transformers, or, you know, the main units. Uh, terminations have been a, a continuous issue. Um, and that's for a number of reason, reasons. I think, you know, just quality control during construction, um, I think, was a challenge. Um, you know, often the vibration that um, you know, the, the equipment causes um, wasn't taken into consideration, um, you know, effectively to um, you know, maintain the, the, the terminations. Um, yeah, and, you know, cables were um, installed to tort, um, you know, so there's, there's quite a few issues, uh, reasons for, for termination issues, but it's, it's been quite a significant issue um, in, 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 in the sector um, and something, you know, again, we are trying to pay a quite a, a close attention to in, in new plants. Um, and then other issues, and for time, I'm just going to whip through some of them, but ventilation has been a key issue for us on specifically on solar. A lot of the early plants were designed uh, with the inverters and transformers um, inside of a, a kiosk or a building, uh, and the ventilation design is not adequate. So, you know, that results in overheating and premature aging and failure of equipment. So having to retrofit, do a lot of retrofit work um, on, mm -hmm. on ventilation systems. Um, and then again, I think transformer issues are also quite prevalent, um, you know, either undersizing, um, heat management issues, poor quality construction, mm -hmm. which, you know, leads to gassing and leaking. And um, so again, um, quite, quite challenging things to, to manage in, in operations. Um, and yeah, and I think the interesting one is, you know, comms um, and, and, and plant controller issues. So comm systems are so key because, you know, it helps you understand what's happening on the plant. You know, is my equipment functioning? What's the performance like? I can't detect underperformance if my communication systems are, you know, to the inverters are not working because of poor design um, and being taken out by lightning, um, you know, on a continuous basis or, you know, not having sufficient redundancy. And then the plant controller um, issue is quite significant. You know, a lot of plant controllers 
Um, I think being custom designed, not off the shelf, um, you know, I think when grid code um, testing was done back in the day, you know, grid code was there, but the procedure and understanding what we needed to check, check and how we do it, um, you know, wasn't done properly. So there was a lot of things that slipped through, uh, slipped through the cracks, which are now mm. coming home to roost in, 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 the, in the grid code retesting, um, which I think is putting a lot of mm. pressure on farms around, around controllers specifically that has to be ripped and replaced or you're struggling to find the, uh, you know, the guy in the company who originally uh, implemented the controller and um, you know, then you have to still have to revert to just ripping everything out. So that's, that's been quite challenging. All right, Slo, Thank, thanks for that. Actually, speaking of grid code, I wanted to ask, um, Ramona, what, what sort of, because I understand the grid code uh, is updated on a regular basis. Um, what sort of challenges do operational plants uh, experience when it comes to adapting to the ever-changing ever uh, grid code uh, rules or I don't know whatever you call it. So uh, Rasmo has already been to its first, uh you know, grid, comp, uh, grid code compliance retesting. Um, and we were fortunate enough to come through it successfully. And I think the key there was that there was a continuous um, oversight from the side of the asset manager and of course the O&M contractors where all of the maintenance was done as scheduled. Um, and we made sure that all of the parts we needed um, there were always spares for it. And we also made sure that all of the relationships were there. I think the biggest challenge we found, fortunately enough, was actually the weather, um, you know, to get a, a day that was compliant in terms of the weather. I think the key to making sure that all of these things go well, obviously, uh, taking into account everything Compton has said with regards to the movement of technology and how parts may have become obsolete and, and manufacturers, uh, manufacturers uh, no longer possibly are in the business is to make sure that the maintenance is always aligned. Uh, that, you know, even though you've got an O&M contractor with, a, with quite a tight contract, there has to be oversight from the, uh, the owners of the asset themselves. And I think if maintain, maintained regularly, um, we should all be able to get through that retesting quite simply and easily. Yeah, okay. No, thank, thanks uh, to all panelists for, I think you've, you've really empowered us with a lot of knowledge from your experience, but I would like to bring in some of the members of the audience uh, to ask the questions. So uh, Kim, please assist us here. I would like to take Sinokolo Kutu to ask her questions uh, to the panelists, please. If you can just promote it to panelists and snuggle up, please open your video and microphone and go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first and foremost, before I ask my question, I just want to say thank you for the um, informative uh, presentation by Chanda and, of course, the information that was as, as dished out by the, the panelists. So my question was in particular, or rather my questions, I have two of them, in fact. Um, one in particular was with regard to um, the warranties, um, the supplier warranties, uh, in terms of um, the duration of the warranty from um, the inception or it does start at the point whereby the project itself, if you are building, for example, a wind farm, so obviously you'll have um, each and every one of those um, units kicking in at different times during the, the, the EPC uh, process. So when does now the warranty start of, of that particular asset? Is it when it kicks in or when the whole project has been officially um, handed over to the, the, o, uh, the O&M a company that will be doing the operation and management of or maintenance thereof? of that particular wind farm. Thank you. I no, think no, any no, of the no. panelists can take that. Okay. Danny. Go ahead, Chanda. 
<laughs> yeah, I'll do a bit. I'll do it. So normally two years. And then so what I said in, in that, it depends on what you negotiate in your contract. Some projects, it is for the entire plant. And when it reaches COD and for others, it's for, it can be on a turbine by turbine basis or a um, string by string basis, which is a nightmare. Don't do it. <laughs> it makes your life awful. Um, I don't know if anybody wants, else wants to join in, but yeah, it depends on what you negotiate in your contract. Generally, the warranties, they last two years from whatever date it is that you've negotiated um, is the average. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it depends. It can be two years, it can be five years, and then also the, you know, some sometimes each piece of main equipment has different warranty periods attached to it. So, um, for example, typically, let's use a common one like uh, PV modules. So PV modules have inherently have a manufacturer warranty, um, which you know I think normally for the first couple of years, any issues, um, you know, sort of sits on the EPC um, to to resolve. But, but post that, the warranty gets ceded to, you know, the project company um, and whatever the terms on that warranty, um, you know, remains is then still in, still in fact directly with, with the manufacturer. Um, mm. But it's very seldom where there's, you know, and, and modules are interesting because they, you know, they have 10 year, um, you know, sort of general warranty, um, you know, for delamination and, um, you know, junction box issues, and then also a longer term warranty um, around performance, which can be quite difficult to prove in any case. Um, so, All yeah. right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll take uh, the next question from Dumile. Is Dumila still with us? Okay, if not, I will um, take the next question from Mamulo Dotlabela. Kim, are you winning? I think Dumila is on now in the company. I've, I've, Dumila is on. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Dumila, you can go ahead. Hi, and thank you for a wonderful session uh, to all. My question is just around the degradation factor when one is doing proper maintenance, uh, proactively so. I just want to know to what extent does the preventive maintenance improve or affect degradation factor basically thank you hello um, i hope i'm um yes go I'm, ahead um, um, i can be ahead now yes i you can hear me you can go ahead and ask your question thank you very much yes. my, my name is Mamulo. yes my question is uh, uh won't it be wise that the EPC contractor be the one that goes forward to do the O&M to avoid the gray area of uh, not honoring the agreements between the O&M as well as the EPC. That's, that's in short, yes. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll hand over to the panel members to answer the two questions. Um, yeah, so I think on the first question, just to clarify, I'm, I'm assuming you were referring to solar PV, um, more, which I think it's got a more, um, let's say... Um, yeah, I think so. You spoke about degradation factor. Okay. Yeah, so I'm assuming it's PV. I know a wind turbines also have a degradation factor, but it's not really dis discussed that much in, in industry. Um, yeah, so first of all, I think determining the degradation factor is quite difficult because of um, you know, sort of high error tolerances in, in measurement equipment and, and measuring uh, sort of performance uh, degradation in, in operations due to the way PV modules work in a, in a table. So, um, so it's quite difficult to, to measure, um, you know, what the real degradation 
um, uh, impact is on an annual basis on, on, uh, on a PV plant. Now, typically during a year, you do some module replacements, um, you know, and, and that would vary from if you have a relatively healthy field to, you know, 0.1% of modules to up to 2% of modules. Um, if you have really, really major issues um, with modules on, the, on an ongoing basis, but even that number uh, in terms of replacement is too small to really, I think, counter any meaningful degradation in, in the field. Um, but general, general maintenance um, um, won't really have a, a significant impact on, uh, on countering degradation um, on, a, on an ongoing basis. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that, that answers, answers the question. And then the second question, um, on EPC, O and M, you know, I think it, there's always pros and cons to everything in life. If you've got an uh, EPC contractor, which becomes the O and M contractor, it's, it's also easier for them to sweep things under the rugs, under the rug. So, you know, if there are major challenges um, during construction, you know, key issues, um, it's easier for them to hide it because, you know, if it's it's the same company becoming the O and M contractor. Um, you know, they can support each other um, in making sure, you know, those issues don't come out and you don't get a chance to raise any, um, any defects um, in, the, in, the, in the warranty period. Um, so, yeah, so, but, but, yeah, but, you know, it could be a mechanism to, um, you know, also keep, keep that business um, around for longer to make sure that, you know, you, you, if you do pick up issues, and that's why I think it's quite important that even though you you do have an OM contractor um, that that you know it's the same company as the EPC, you have your own uh, resources um, on site um, that can technically understand, assess the plant on an ongoing basis, and make sure um, that they discover any challenges which needs to be managed. Um, you know, once once that um, OM contractor leaves. All right, um, I think the last question, there's a very interesting question from anonymous attendee. Uh, so we can't promote them to ask their question, but I'm just gonna read it out. Can the panel comment on painting one turbine blade black or red as a mitigation for bad collision in impacts? It has been said that this may arise, this may raise weight or warranty issues but this should no longer be a barrier to testing this promising mitigation. It has been done in, in, on wind farms internationally and hopefully will be uh, trialed soon in South Africa. Two operational facilities are seriously considering this. Uh, I'm gonna put Lindani on the spot as an asset manager for wind farms. Over to you, Lindani. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, we have not explored this before, but I am aware that Global Egg has, um, and maybe Compton, you want to help me here. Uh, I think one of the barriers to that was air traffic control, because when you start to paint the blades black, you know, they've got issues with that. They would rather have a different color. I think the color was red, um, but that doesn't really help the situation. I don't know if Compton, you want to help me with this one, but we, we haven't really looked into the painting of blades, uh, but I know I've heard that other people are looking at it. Now we're also still looking at looking at it as an option, so not not make made the decision to go ahead. Um, but I think Chanda, you are probably more better placed than anybody else to uh, know what what's been happening in, in the broader industry around the blade painting. <laughs> I think one of the issues is the, the EIA and how getting that across the line because it changes your visual impact. Um, and it it's only been done, I believe, on one wind farm globally, but I stand to be corrected. So um, I, I think it's something, well, I think there's a couple of questions that you need to ask. How how big is the, um, are, is the impact of the bird collisions on your site? But not all sites have significant issues with birds. So you don't necessarily need to go down this path. And there's a lot of um, monitoring that's put in place on the projects that do have these issues that wouldn't necessarily lead to you then having to, to go and 
um, paint the turbines. I think there's a few things that need to be taken into consideration. I, I don't know any, or I haven't come across projects that are looking at it in the South African market, um, to be honest. Hmm. No, thanks for that. Um, and yes, it is something that is an ongoing discussion in our environment working group. There are projects that are uh, planning to trial that. And uh, we, we just gonna wait for the trial and see. But um, Bed Life South Africa um, is, is basically saying that until they can see the impact of that as a mitigation measure, uh, they, they, they're they not sure if it's effective. Uh, so then the onus rests upon us as an industry to trial it and, uh, and, and show the results. Um, Okay, so I've got a question uh, from another. Okay, uh, okay, I've got a question from Shagula Shikongo. Uh, can I ask him to promote him to ask his question? Or maybe before, while Kim is busy with that, I see Sino, Sino Vuyos, Sino Kolo's hand is up. Do you want to ask a question or comment? Uh, yes, no, Futi. Um, I, I think it's just a, a follow-up question uh, to uh, specifically to Ramona with regard to the skills development. I mean, given the fact that um, renewable energy is is some uh, is still a very young industry when it comes to to South Africa, although globally in parts like Europe and America and China they have actually advanced it to some to some significant level. Now, now looking at um, this, I wanted to ask the question of what, what specific uh, strategies or measures have been put in place in order to you know, promote uh, skills development and, and job creation in the areas where these um, plants operate, be it a PV plant, be it a, um, um, a wind farm. So what, what, what strategies or, or measures are put in place to promote skills development in these in this particular areas? Uh, thank you for right. that, and, and that's uh, that's quite an interesting question, and it's quite uh, relevant. And uh, for Rasmo specifically, uh, we have had a strategy that was in place um, from the start of the plant. As I said earlier, when it came to EPC, there was already community members involved. Um, in terms of skills development, uh, we have hired from within the community um, and even our security guards that we have upskilled into those positions uh, of being security supervisors have de been developed within RASMO. Uh, we are very fortunate in that even our ONM contractor does get involved in upskilling community members as well um, in the actual ONM functionality. Uh, it's the process is not always as simple for to get people to the level that we need as quickly as we would hope. Uh, so with the hope obviously is that the skills development levels will get that much higher. So we'll find people from local communities that have the ability to do um, the higher level technical skills um, and be able to be sitting next to Compton the next time around uh, to share their skills and how they've been developed. And that would obviously come from a skills transfer point of view as well. Um, in terms of uplifting the communities, um, there is a certain percentage of, of what we do that pours right back into the community that we work in. Uh, from building infrastructure to, you know, we've built an ECD, we have supported clinics with PPE, we have given people meals when that was necessary. So the, com the community outreach from an education to a social point of view um, is always there. And it's a commitment that we are not only obligated to, but we are quite happy to be involved in. I hope that answers that question. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ramona. Um, Shagula Shikongo, you had a question on the Q&A. Please go ahead and ask your question. Hi, 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 everybody. Um, uh, Shakulai here from uh, Vented Namibia. Um, uh, thank you, thank you so much for the platform. And uh, we wish we have similar platform here back at home here in Vented. Um, uh, the well, question... you can create the platforms. 
Yeah, yeah, I can create. Ask us Kuda Kwasha to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I would do so. Well, um, what we're basically working on here, just to give you a brief um, description of what we're busy doing, is we're trying to explore what are the potentials of uh, offshore wind in uh, in in South in, in Namibia, most especially here in Ludret. And we, uh, I needed to, I needed to find out what are the, the the current advancements when it comes to exploration for for offshore wind in South Africa. Has there has there been any players that have uh, that have stood out? I stand out to to say that we will be busy working on this as well. So yeah, I'm just yeah, just want to find out on on that. Thank you. Mm. All right. Uh, maybe, maybe I can take this one because I had a long chat with one of the developers last week. Um, after I said there are no offshore wind developers, I was actually corrected. There are a couple of developers who are exploring a development of offshore wind in the country. Uh, early stages, of course, uh, but um, they, they, they have a backing of large companies from overseas. And um, I know of a company as well that used to be our member that was doing a pre-feasibility study for offshore wind development. Biggest issue, of course, is the fact that our shores are very deep and therefore uh, uh, we need to use uh, floating foundations uh, for, for offshore development. But because we have the technology now, there is a huge possibility for that to happen. Um, I'm not sure if uh, in the next 10 years we're going to see an offshore wind farm, but I know there are development activities happening. And um, maybe uh, one of the panelists have a, a, a better answer to that. All right. Um, I want to wrap up um, the Q&A session, but there's an interesting question here. Oh, okay, I see Ramona is busy answering that, so I am not going to go to that. So thank you also, uh, panelists, for uh, answering some of the questions that I have skipped through because I thought they just need one with answer and it doesn't need a discussion. So if you can assist us with that. Um, I'm going to do one last round uh, to all the panelists because I have one question to ask all of you. What are the opportunities available for um, small and emerging companies that want to participate in the O&M of either solar PV or wind that are looking for opportunities to, to, to position themselves, especially as we are going into the growth phase of IRP 2019 implementation. Then um, I will do uh, each one of the panelists, including Chanda, and then after that, I will hand over to my co-host, Nivation. Okay, maybe I can start with Obi, if you allow me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, opportunities in the, in the space, um, just from a high level, from an engineering point of view, there's just a huge drive now that the industry is, is maturing towards a more condition-based and proactive-based maintenance approach. You know, I think the entire industry is looking for um, South African solutions. You know, we find that some of the things we are seeing here for the first time. Um, so from a consultancy point of view, I think there is an opportunity for South African engineering consultant to venture into um, maybe upskill themselves and venture into the consultancy of specifically on wind systems, you know, looking at uh, condition monitoring in the sense of vibration measurement on drivetrain components, looking at condition monitoring in the sense of oil sampling, etc. So um, I find that that space is still quite uh, young and people can really exploit that, op um, that, that area of operation. But over and above that, um, I've also found that specifically on wind farms and the blades um, if, if I may be actually very specific, the, there's a very limited number of um, contractors operating in the blade repair space and blade inspection space. So um, I think there's still a large scope looking at round five, which will come on soon. You know, the number of blades just increases. For every turbine, you've got three blades. So that's basically the exponential rate of the increase of the number of work that um, needs to be uh, done on, on that. So um, yes, there are opportunities with maintenance, uh, supporting on the electrical balance of plant, which is a transformer in the substation. 
Um, we have seen that a lot of the contractors have focused a lot on that. But for me, I would just share just those uh, main ones, which is the blades and the condition monitoring and the engineering support. And the other panelists can um, give more input. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Lindani. Um, who, who, who wants to go next? Thanks, Lindani. Um, I, I think I agree with Lindani that there's definitely a great opportunity for growth and exploration of um, anyone that would be interested in the industry because there are definitely markets that could be expanded. Um, I also think that once again, and I feel like I've harbored on this point the entire panel, but um, I think that relationships are key. Um, and I think that's probably where uh, any new entrants to the market are going to have to make sure that they find strengths because a lot of us have relationships with all the contractors, uh, be it the O&M contractors or you know, even the people that maintain our cameras and fences, whatever the case may be. So I think that um, there has to be a knowledge of the industry. There has to be a knowledge of the challenges, the pros, the cons. And I think it also hinges a lot on can you get a status and level of relationship with all of the people in the market that already exists with the current contractors that are in play? Thanks. Thank you. Um, Crompton, Tom, Chanda. Um, Domi, yeah, I think this is quite a, quite a challenging topic um, because it's, it's much more challenging than it sounds, um, you know, speaking about it and, and making it happen, um, I think is quite difficult. Um, and maybe just to look at, I think an example of where this has potentially happened well, um, and to use a solar example, I think it's also being used more in the wind now, but, um, you know, back in 2014, everybody was doing handheld um, IR scans on, on PV plants, which was absolutely useless. Um, you know, took a lot of time, didn't offer, you know, quite a lot of value for, for effort. Um, and until, you know, drones um, have become more commonplace um, to, 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 to scan plants. So, you know, on none of our plants, we do any more handout scans. And I think there's been fantastic examples of companies like, you know, I think Geosun Walk 62, who stepped into a space um, and I think, you know, I've put in the effort to, I think, improve the capability, um, you know, and service offerings, not just in um, South Africa, but, um, you know, also in, in, in the rest of Africa. So I think in, you know, I think in, in the digital space at the moment, there's, there's, there's I think, good opportunities. Um, I think, as um, Lindani said, you know, around predictive, uh, preventive maintenance, but I also think it's important to, to understand that, um, you know, it's easy to latch onto jargon about, um, you know, digitization and, you know, AI and machine learning, but, um, you know, the real applications of these things in our industry um, is, is, is not as easy as it sounds. You know, everybody's trying to sell you something which uh, will offer you, offer you the world, but, um, you know, never, never really does that. So I think there's a bit of an opportunity um, um, for, I think, uh, you know, a, a sort of a bit of a niche consultancy for people to um, get comfortable with, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, data streams that come off these plants, um, you know, looking at stuff that, you know, is sensible, not try and, and uh, you know, look at a million data tags when you only need 10 to really tell you the real story. Um, and to be able to build um, you know, algorithms that, um, you know, I think look at the, the value areas. So for example, on a solar plant, um, looking at string level, um, you know, being able to under detect underperformance, um, you know, looking at blade pitch, being able to understand if there, there are issues um, and building that into, you know, very simple usable um, system that can, um, I think, you know, be, be useful. Um, to better understand and, and, and how we manage, manage these plants. So I think there's right. a, the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, additional comments. Do you have anything, uh, Tom, Chanda, before I hand over to Nivesh? Just 
one maybe. I think that digitalization and AI is very cool. There's also deeply uncool areas that there's opportunities. Cleaning panels, not cool, but someone has to do it and be paid for it, right? Um, and if you can provide a good service with an understanding of panels, and that's not just at utility scale, right? You need to think all of the CNI rooftop, who's looking after those um, and who's monitoring those. Um, cutting grass it, 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 mm. I know it's not it's not thrilling but it is a business stream right and so I think we also need to there's a, ho a whole wide range of of things that need to be looked at for a, an asset that um that mm. there are opportunities yeah thanks Chanda um I'm Tomifuti yes uh, just one thing for me that I want to raise I I agree with both Gordon and Lenilani. There is growth for potential, uh, I think. Uh, however, with, when you're looking at expertise and training involved, uh, there is a challenge of getting people trained to do this specialized task. But I think going forward, uh, I know we have partnered with some of the training centers to get people up to that skills level. Uh, it will take a bit longer, but there are some programs in place and also having part of the local service providers, contractors, in order to mm. work more with people around the neighboring wind farms and also uplifting skills development. Yeah, that's all. For me. All right, uh, thank, you. thank you so much, uh, panelists. And uh, this is how I wrap it up. And thank you so much for all your insights and sharing your experience with our audience. We really appreciate it. And um, we've got exciting things coming up at the end of the series and Nivashin is gonna tell you all about it. But from me, thank you. And I'm gonna hand over to uh, Nivesh. Thank you very much, Ntombi. Uh, I think a lot of great information being shared today. Uh, so thank you to all of the panelists for covering such a variety of topics uh, in such detail that it actually allows people to better understand uh, this space of asset management operations and maintenance. Um, so basically, as you all know, uh, seven months ago, Sapia and so we are embarked on this journey uh, to have this joint information, information sharing webinar series. It was for the first time, uh, and we think that we've, um, we've been extremely successful in this. So we hope as an outcome of this series of webinars, We've been able to inspire emerging, emerging project developers uh, and create more interest for meaningful local participation in renewable energy. Some key success indicators on your slide will show uh, that we've managed to bring together four associations, this being SAPIA, the Solar PV Industry Association. So we are the Wind Energy Association, PEPA, the Black Energy Professionals Association, and REFSA, the Renewable Energy Entrepreneurs Forum in South Africa. Uh, we hosted seven very well-planned sessions. We provided 15 hours of pure information from real learnings over the last six months. We covered 28 topics in total with, with 38 speakers who are seasoned industry leaders and experts. We saw excellent participation with just under 3,500 registered participation, uh, participants across the seven webinars and just under 2,000 in full attendance. Uh, this is around an average of 284 attendees per webinar. Uh, and we, we definitely don't want to forget our 11 partners and sponsors who helped make this possible. So a big thank you to the IPP office, firstly, uh, who worked with us as industry, uh, and opened up the series to start with. Uh, our sponsors, uh, UV Renewable Energies, Mainstream Renewable Power, who were both series sponsors across all seven webinars. Uh, and then Standard Bank, uh, Norton Rose, ED Platform, WKN Wind Current, and Hamilton Renewables, who uh, sponsored specific webinars and specific topics. I would also like to thank the Safia and Sawia teams uh, working behind the scene. Uh, Ms. Kim Thomas, I'm sure all of you have heard from her many a time. Uh, Ms. Marilisa Stoltz, uh, Ms. Chanda Kumalo, Mr. Lindo Sibia, uh, and not forgetting Ntombi uh, and myself. So Ntombi, I'll congratulate you and I'll let you congratulate me later. 
Um, in terms of our service provider who assisted in managing and marketing the series, it's a company called Zani, uh, led by Ms. Nokwanda Nzimande. Uh, thank you for all of the hard work and a shout out to a young black woman owned professional service provider. Uh, so anyone looking for assistance in webinars, marketing and comms in general, this is the a service provider that I would recommend. Before we go, I would also like to announce the two new webinar series uh, that are coming up over the next six months. So the first one in partnership with Sawia again, uh, and I'm really happy to be handing over the reins to our colleagues at Sawia who will be leading uh, this initiative. Uh, we'll be launching the Developing Local Supply Chains series of webinars. Uh, the dates and topics are to be announced and will be shared and circulated soon. Uh, and then the, the next webinar series uh, is a SAPIA initiative, uh, and this will be launching the Driving Distributed Generation series of webinars. The dates and topics are on the slide. Uh, more information will be supplied uh, shortly after this series closes. In that, I would like to thank again the speakers. Uh, thank you, Ntumbi. Thank you to the sponsors. And thank you, everybody, for participating. And thanks, Nivashin, for a great initiative. Um, I think we have we have made sure that we, we put the industry together to impart uh, the knowledge that is sitting within the industry. And I hope uh, South Africa has benefited a lot from the series. And thank you so much for to all the participants. Uh, and we look forward to having you in our next uh, series of webinars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.